We are going to start off now with chapter 17. We're going to start talking about how our DNA actually becomes proteins. The process of taking this DNA, taking the genes on our DNA, and transforming it into proteins. Back in the 30s, there was a theory that came out um, talking about how one gene will produce one enzyme because um, scientists, I don't know if it was Beetle at the time, was working on um, looking at um, genetic disorders, knowing, of course, we have all of this information about Mendelian genetics. We have all of this information about meiosis and mitosis. And we know how inherited traits come about. After the discovery, um, I guess it wasn't in the 30s, it must have been in the 60s. After the discovery of DNA being that genetic material by Hershey and Chase and 51 and stuff and all of this work moving forward, it started to make sense how these proteins are being expressed or these enzymes are being expressed coming from the gene. If there was a mutation on the gene, then there was a mutation in the expression of these enzymes. And at first it was believed that it was one, pro one gene, one enzyme. Now we know that enzymes are all proteins. And so through the years it had been modified saying, well, one gene, one polypeptide. And you can read through the experiments of Beetle and Tatum in determining in the mid-60s overall <clears throat> that it was this one gene, one polypeptide theory, one hypothesis. Um, now, the problem is when we said, or when they said early on, one gene, one enzyme, if you remember from chapter 5, when we talked about proteins, proteins can take on all kinds of different structural levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, coordinary. Well, the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of a, of a protein is all dealing with just one polypeptide. But when you throw that quaternary structure in there, now we're talking about maybe two or more polypeptides or creating that protein to make its conformational shape. And so the theory of one gene, one enzyme, or one gene, one protein was kind of like, well, maybe not. Maybe it's one gene, one polypeptide. Okay. So even though a protein might consist of four polypeptides, each one of those was created by one section of gene on the DNA. Now we have even further advanced that, saying, well, not all genes or not all RNA makes proteins, and not um, sometimes there are parts of that DNA or parts of that gene that might make several polypeptides. And so it has even further been modified from there. But overall, for our purposes, we're going to consider it saying that one gene on our DNA one sequence of nucleotides is involved in making one polypeptide, okay? A part, if not a complete protein. Does that make sense? So that's what our, hmm? Not one nucleotide, one gene. One sequence of nucleotides is responsible for making one polypeptide. <clears throat> now, when we start talking about protein synthesis or the, dis the production of these proteins, we have to take into account that our DNA is always inside of our nucleus. We don't have DNA floating around in our cytosol, floating around in the cytoplasm. Bacteria cells do. Bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells, they don't have a nucleus. So their DNA is in their cytoplasm. Their DNA is in direct contact with their RNA and can synthesize proteins very quickly, okay? Whereas our cells, eukaryotic cells, have this membrane-bound nucleus, and the DNA, except when it's going through cell division, is found inside of this nucleus, and it doesn't leave this nucleus. So it needs something to leave the nucleus and perform this work for them, to say, hey, here's my gene. This is what I need you to make. I, you have to make this enzyme, or you have to make this protein. Go out there and do it. Well, it needs somebody to send out and do it. And so it uses counterparts, another nucleic acid known as RNA, ribonucleic acid. And ribonucleic acid, or RNA, can actually be found in three different forms. 
three different ways that we talk about RNA. One is messenger RNA, or mRNA. And what messenger RNA does is it actually carries that message that DNA is trying to put forth. It's the one that's going to take the message of the gene, saying, here's what needs to be completed. It's going to take that message and go out and do that work. Another RNA is known as transfer RNA. or tRNA. And what transfer RNA does is it actually transfers that message into amino acids. RNA is just like DNA. It's made up of nucleotides. It's made up of a phosphate group, a sugar group, and um, a nitrogenous base, a nucleotide. RNAs are nucleotides. Well, proteins are amino acids. They're different in appearance than nucleotides. And so what transfer RNA does is it reads that message off of messenger RNA saying this is the gene, this is what needs to be made, and so it'll read that message and transfer it into amino acids. And then the third type of RNA that we're going to talk about is ribosomal RNA or rRNA. And what ribosomal RNA does is it takes, um, it takes these messenger RNA and this transfer RNA, and it's basically the building block or that, that building unit to make these proteins, to assemble these proteins. Imagine it as the factory to assemble these proteins. Um, and so these are the three main types of RNA that we're going to see through this process of protein synthesis, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. <clears throat> OK? Question? Ribosomal RNA, it is actually the RNA that's found in our ribosomes, RNA and proteins, that actually works or is, is where proteins are going to be put together the place where proteins are actually synthesized. And if you remember, talking about our cell back in Chapter 7, ribosomes are the site for protein synthesis. And that's what they do. This is the factory. This is the plant, okay, where it's going to be manufactured. Messenger RNA basically takes that message from the DNA, copies that message from the, from the gene of interest, saying, make this protein takes it out basically to the ribosomes. And it's in the ribosomes that the transfer RNA also comes, combines with that message to put out that protein. Okay, so this is the process. These are, or these are the, the molecules that are going to be involved. Well, what's happening here is basically this DNA molecule stays inside the nucleus. He's not going to leave the nucleus. He remains inside there. He goes through his DNA replication inside there, all that stuff. But he also goes through this process of making all of these RNA molecules. This very long, you know, we saw six billion nucleotides, not six million, but six billion nucleotides long. This molecule of DNA has on it about 300,000 genes or so on its, on its, in its nucleic acid sequence, a very specific sequence describing those different genes. Well, when it has to get that point across saying, hey, my cell is stimulated, I have to release um, beta-galactosidase so that I can actually digest milk products in my stomach. When I have to make that protein, that milk in my stomach is going to stimulate my DNA to go through this process of protein synthesis to make that enzyme. What it does is it causes that DNA to make RNA, basically messenger RNA, but even these other RNAs too. This process of going from DNA to RNA is known as transcription. Basically what's happening is DNA and RNA are the same language. They speak the same language. They, they're both talking in nucleic acids. 
okay? They're both the same. The major difference is, is DNA has the deoxyribose sugar, RNA has the ribose sugar, right? DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil, okay? So those are, it's still the same language. There's just a slight variations, a little bit of a tweak here and there. But what's happening is DNA saying, here's my gene. I need you to go and make this for me. We used the example before of DNA being the architect, right? Drawing out the blueprints. And RNA being the general contractor, it's going to go out and make that building, right? Well, transcription is that process of putting it down putting it down on paper so that you can read it or transcribe it. You're taking notes right now. You're transcribing what I'm saying to you and putting it down on paper, aren't you? And by doing that, you got it to refer back to at a later date. Now, RNA will take that information from DNA. The general contractor picks up the blueprints. Um, you take your papers home to study from or whatever. And what he's got to do now is change it into a whole completely different language. Who speaks a different language in here? What do you speak? Degala and what? Masai. What is, do your parents speak English? Not really. So anytime you speak to them, you probably speak to them in Degala or whatever, right? Completely different language. If you were to go home and, and call your mom up on the phone and say, this is what I've learned in class today, you would, do you write in your notes in Tagali or do you write in English? Okay. So you're transcribing in English, but then you're going to read your notes, talking to her on the phone, saying, that it, you know, going off and talking, talking, talking. You're translating it to her, right? Putting it into a completely different language, right? And that's what RNA does. It takes these nucleotides, these nucleic acids, puts it into a completely different language when it makes proteins, because proteins are made up of amino acids. And it's completely different in appearance. When we're talking a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base, right? And an amino acid was a carbon and that carboxyl group, and an amine group, right? That doesn't look anything in that nice little R group coming off down here. This is very different. Now, I didn't draw up the molecular formula here, but it's very, or a structural formula, but it's very different, aren't they? They're two completely types of molecules, completely different language. And so RNA will go through the process of translating that DNA message into proteins. So this, from RNA to proteins, is known as translation. Taking that nucleic acid and translating it into amino acids. Just like she goes home and takes her English notes that she transcribed and translates it into Tagali. Okay? Or into Spanish or into Italian or into whatever. Okay? You're translating it into a completely different language. It's almost like if we had somebody that, um, I don't know what the alphabet is like in Tagali, but, you know, um, like Japanese or Chinese, how it's just, you know, those little lines and things like that. Very different than the English language, right? Or the alphabet of English or Spanish or Italian or something. I mean, they're lines and shapes, and I can't read it. But they're characters that represent words. Exactly. It's, it's a whole, the whole thing is a word, you know, just how it has the little flags and tags and lines and completely different languages, okay? Taking it and translating it into those symbols now, or even sign language, completely different language, isn't it? Okay? Translating it. And that's what our RNA does. It translates this DNA message into protein. Um, our RNA will actually leave the nucleus in order to do that. Where's what I want? <clears throat> if we 
look at this, and I forgot my eraser today. Last day of class, and I forget my eraser. Go figure. What you see here, I'm not going to worry about the prokaryotic cell on the top. I'm more concerned here about this eukaryotic cell. We've got our DNA molecule inside of our nucleus. This DNA will transcribe this messenger RNA inside the nucleus. It'll transcribe it inside the nucleus. Once it creates that messenger RNA, that, that RNA molecule that is going to carry its instructions out of the nucleus, it will come together, that messenger RNA will come together with this ribosome and in turn translate that message into this polypeptide into the makings of a protein, converting it now to amino acids from nucleic acids. That general contractor taking the blueprints and putting it into a building with the slab or the foundation or the piece of property being that ribosome that allows it to be built upon. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, well, what we've got going here, or what we're going to see or talk about, is the process of taking this molecule, I went through these earlier to have them in order. I don't know where it is. There it is. Okay. Now, our DNA, it's a double-stranded molecule. Our DNA is... Um, made up of these two strands of nucleotides. Now, what we need to keep in mind, though, when it comes to our DNA is that only one of the two strands is going to be our gene. It's going to be our nucleic acid sequence that is going to be transcribed and then translated into a protein. Only one of the two strands. The other one is just it's not is just its complementary base pair. So when we're dealing with our, our DNA, we need to keep that in mind. So um, Okay, so if this is one strand of DNA, five prime and three prime, what's my complementary base pair going to be to my DNA? So now this is my complementary base pair, okay? So now this is my strand of DNA. With this being my strand of DNA, only one of the two strands is going to be my gene of interest. Now, which direction did DNA replicate? Five, to five. five prime to three prime. Which line up here do you think is going to be my template strand of DNA or my gene of interest? that is going to create my new RNA sequence? The one on top or the one on bottom? This one or this one? Bottom. The bottom. This one is going in the three prime to five prime direction, right? So now, when I go to make my transcript, when I go to make my, my RNA, what I'm going to do is complementary base pair RNA nucleotides to this gene of interest. And so what I will do is still RNA will add in that 5 to 3 direction, going from 5 prime to 3 prime, just like DNA did. Because it's the same kind of nucleotide. It still has the three phosphate groups. It's going to lose the two. It's going to come together with that number 5 carbon attaching to the number 3 hydroxyl carbon. 
removing that water out. The three prime to five prime sequence of DNA is our gene of interest. Okay? So now, if I was to make my RNA, I would be copying it, complementary base pairing it in the five prime to three prime direction. So if I was to do that, what would be my complementary base pairs here? U. All right, I got it. Oh, that's not a U. See, I don't even know it. A, A, C, U, U, A, G. Okay? And then my three prime over here. So that's how I would complementary base pair it. You've got to remember, one of the key things to remember is that when you're complementary base pairing RNA to DNA, that Adenine is still going to complementary base pair, but now it's going to utilize uracil instead of thymine. It's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that when they're making their RNA strand, they do A to T. Or they do T to U, thinking that, well, if it's a thymine here in the DNA, it must be uracil here in the RNA. That doesn't complementary base pair. In RNA, a is going to complement to U, and G still complements to C, okay? So you've got to remember to get those uracils in there versus those thymines when you're complementary base pairing. Well, if we have this complement here, we can see that, you know, we've got just this long sequence of nucleotides. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But what this long sequence of nucleotides does is it takes this gene, converts it to this RNA, now allows this RNA to go out and make proteins. And the way that this RNA makes proteins is in a reading frame. It has basically a three-letter reading frame, or three-letter words to its reading frame. Every three letters represents, ah, oh, gosh darn it, I'm going to change this here. You've got that in your notes, change it. Well, I'll keep that as an A, I'll change this to an A. Um, there's a reason. Um, let's see. Okay, so you see these three-letter reading, these three-letter words? These three-letter words are what we call codons. Codons are found on the messenger RNA, and this is what has led to this university or universal relationship among all organisms. These codons, these three-letter words, represent very specific amino acids. These three-letter words are going to create what we call the genetic code. The genetic code is a code. If you've ever watched any kind of spy movies or anything like that and you know how like codes are meant to be broken and deciphered and things like that, um, what the genetic code does is each codon will code for a very specific amino acid. Each one codes for a very specific amino acid. And this genetic code was determined once again way back when um, by a series of experiments just running, running through saying, okay, well what amino acid will join to this nucleic acid sequence or this codon sequence? U, 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 U. If I have just a, a long RNA of just uracils, what amino acids does that attract? And it always attracted the same amino acid, the amino acid phenylalanine. And so they used this mechanism for determining this genetic code. 
And the code is universal. The code is the same across the board. No matter what kind of organism you are talking about, no matter what kind of DNA sample you're looking at or gene that you're looking at, this genetic code here, and it's on a chart. It's not a chart you have to memorize. It's a chart. Charts are there to look at and utilize, not memorize. But this genetic code here represents every possible codon there could be. If a codon is a three-letter word, well, first of all, let's, let's back up for a minute. How many amino acids are there? Hmm? There's 20 different amino acids. How many nucleotides are there? Four. There's four different nucleotides or, and 20 different amino acids. Now, if I had one nucleotide per amino acid, that would only count for four, four amino acids, right? If I had two nucleotides, that would make up every amino acid. That would be four to the second power, which would be 16. That still doesn't give me every amino acid, does it? I'm sorry? There are, okay, it, it's, not, it's not the production of those amino acids making the amino acids. It's actually making a protein using those amino acids. Yes, our body, we can't make 80 essential amino acids, but we still need to use them to make our proteins. We still have, so we get them available to use through the foods that we eat. But if I had only 16, if I had two-letter words, you know, type of thing, I only have 16 possible words that I can make, or 16 possible combinations, which does not account for all 20 amino acids. Does that make sense? Okay? So that doesn't work. If I had, however, the three-letter words, how many possible combinations? There's 64 possible combinations now. So that accounts allows me to have all 20 amino acids. But it actually allows me to have all 20 amino acids about three times each. Okay? And this leads to basically um, redundancy when it comes to the genetic code. And if you look over here, the genetic code is basically broken down out of, to create all 64 three-letter words, all 64 possible codons. And how you read this chart is on this side, on the left here, we have our first nucleotide, um, U, C, A, or G. So, for example, here we have A as our first nucleotide. The second base is going across the top, U, C, A, and G. Okay? So you would figure out, well, we have A. Now, my second nucleotide there is a U. So here's my U. And then the, over on the right side here is our third base. And so I come all the way down until I, I'm in my A, my U, and then there's my G. And so now I see that AUG codes for a very specific amino acid known as methionine, or MET, as it's abbreviated up here. Well, AUG is a very important codon. AUG codes for this amino acid known as methionine, but AUG is also what we call the start codon. Every single messenger RNA, every single, I should even go further back than that, every single gene will code for the first codon to be AUG. And AUG always codes for methionine, but it's what we call the start codon. So every messenger RNA is going to start with AUG as its first codon. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't find AUG somewhere else in this gene sequence or in this messenger RNA sequence. It's just that it is always that amino acid that starts it all off. It has to be there to start it all off. And I put it there to start it all off, didn't I? So AUG is coding for that very specific amino acid, methionine, but it's also my start codon. Now, the only way to get methionine is by the sequence AUG. But I said there was redundancy, didn't I? 
And if you look on this chart, you can see that redundancy. There are six ways to create the amino acid leucine, LEU. Six different ways. Majority of it is this third nucleotide base. You see the first and second ones are the same, and that third base can be any of the four nucleotides and still give me leucine. I also can use yours or you as the first one or your cell as my first codon for two t ways and get leucine also. Redundancy. What this means is there could be a mutation in our DNA. But if that mutation happened, let's see, what is CUU? Do I have a CUU up here? Of course not. That would make life too easy. No, this, it's ACU. <laughs> the code on the way it's set up. Let's see. Um, you, oh, shoot, I got another one in there. Gosh darn it. Let me change this again. I don't want those in there. I don't normally do that. Um, anyway, well, let's see. AAG, AAG, AAG. AAG for lysine, or it could have been, I could have mutated from AAG, I could have mutated it and had AAA and still come up with the same amino acid. Okay, guanine and adenine are both purines. If there was a mutation here somewhere in my DNA that converted this cytosine here to a thymine, well then this would have been an adenine but I still would have come up with the same amino acid of lysine. You see where I'm going with that? There is this redundancy. Look, for arginine, there's four possible combinations here and two more down here. Six ways, once again, to form the amino acid arginine. If there's a mutation in the DNA, that's okay. If it happens at that third base pair, I'm still going to get arginine. I'm still not going to show any kind of error in my protein. And that's the key because what we see expressed and the conformational characteristics and the functionality of our proteins all relates on how those new, um, amino acids are lined up, how the DNA said to put this protein together. And if it doesn't put it together properly, then the protein's not going to work properly. But even if there's an error in the DNA, I can still put the protein together property, properly. Does that make sense? This third base pair here doesn't need to match up perfectly in the majority of our amino acids. It's known as the wobble effect. It allows it to kind of quaver a little bit, kind of maybe not match up perfectly. And if it doesn't match up perfectly, that's okay. I'm still getting the protein I need. You can see four ways of getting glycine, four ways of getting alanine and valine and threonine and proline and serine. This repetition, this redundancy allows for that slight modification. DNA is pretty accurate in its replication, but there are sometimes mutations. If it happens in a gene, it's okay if it's that third base of our codon. We're still going to get the same amino acid. So what's my amino acid sequence here? If I've got, um, we already said that this first one here is methionine. What's CAU? Histine, H-I-S. A-A-G? Lysine? G-A-U? Everybody see how to read that chart? Asparagine. U-A-U? T-H-R? Styrene. A-G-A? Oh, T-Y-R? Tyrosine. Tyrosine. T-Y-R. A-G-A? A-R-G? R-G. Um, A-C-U? And U-A-G? Okay, what this has done is it has allowed us to take this 
messenger RNA or this gene off of our DNA. We've converted it to a messenger RNA. We've carried that message and now we have translated it into a protein sequence. Now, we had a stop code on. UAG said stop. Is that an amino acid? No. The stop codons, there are three of them. These three stop codons signify the end of our gene. And that in turn signifies the end of our protein. And so we don't need, once that happens, everything falls apart and now we have that primary structure of a protein. It can move on and go and do whatever it needs to do. Take on its secondary, tertiary, quaternary shape. Okay? Once we've reached that stop protein or that stop codon. There are three different stop codons. Um, UAG, um, University of App, no. No, that's UGA, see? That's UGA. That's another stop codon, though. Okay, we have U UGA, University of Georgia, Athens. We have UAG, which is what's up here, um, University of Athens, Georgia, Athens, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and UAA, University of Alaska. Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> you know, something like that. But you got these three stop codons here. These three stop codons say, that's the end of my chain. That's the end of my protein. When I get to that stop codon, everything breaks apart. We know we're finished. Just like AUG was the start of everything, these three, one of these three codons is going to be a stop. Now, I changed two different places in here because I had stop codons by mistake. That would end up being like a mutation. If I mutated this DNA here and then created a stop codon right here, I wouldn't get a complete protein, would I? I would not get a functional protein, and in turn, that would be damaging to the cell or to the organism overall, depending on what that stop protein, how, where it stopped it and things like that. Nope. If it's a mutation in the DNA, it's there generation after generation after generation. That one mutation, if the DNA missed it in DNA replication or, or the UV lights mutated that DNA, and when it went to replicate again, DNA is so accurate, it would copy it exactly the same in every cell thereafter. And that's where these mutations happen, where these sparks occur. If it, if ultraviolet light caused that cell to mutate and that cell went to divide, boom. It's mutated in every cell thereafter. Okay. So this genetic code is redundant in having several different ways of coding for the same amino acids. Some of them not so many. You know, phenylalanine, there's only two ways of doing it. Tyrosine, there's only two ways of getting it. Cysteine, there's only two ways of getting it. But still, there's at least two possible ways of getting these amino acids. Other ones that, of course, if you, if you had to really think about it, we're using valine, alanine, glycine, these amino acids, more frequently in our proteins. That's why there's more redundancy when it comes to them. They're utilized more often. Um, what's the amino acid that you take working out that we talked about? Huh? Tryptophan? Is that... No, tryptophan's in turkey. What's the amino acid? Like, you take supplements of? Huh? Creatine, but that's not an amino acid. I thought... Pyrite. Pyrite, oh, yeah, that's what you were talking about. It's something different. Glutamine. Um, this is your... No, this is glycine. This is glutamic acid. Glut is GLN glutamine? Or is GLU glutamine? GLU is glutamine. GLN is glutamic acid, I think. I don't know. One or the other. No, this is glutamine. Anyway. Arginine? ARG? To, to boost them up and yeah, boost the proteins. Like anyway, we can see how that redundancy is there, okay? Any questions on reading this genetic code or figuring out how to work this genetic code? 
No. And like I said, you can read through the experiments that they did to determine how they came up with this genetic code. The key that you want to remember, though, is this genetic code is based on the messenger RNA's codons. It is reading the codons, reading that messenger RNA and its codons, okay? <clears throat> okay. So if we look back here again, this is basically what I have up on the board. We have our DNA strand, that template DNA, that sequence that's going to give us our gene of interest. We transcribe our RNA, which is a complementary base pair to it, and from there, this RNA, these codons, will translate into the very specific proteins or very specific amino acids. What, what page are we on? Um, well, page 307. 173. 173. Okay. So if there are no other questions on that, then we'll move forward and start talking about transcription. Any questions? Okay. Transcription is what basically begins this whole process, puts it all into motion. Transcription is the DNA becomes stimulated. It says, this gene I need you to become activated. I need you to go forward and make a specific polypeptide. This is what has to be done. It's either an outside influence or, you know, a hormone, a steroid, um, something coming in that's stimulating the cell, signaling for the DNA to produce this polypeptide. Well, if this is our DNA sequence, you can see 5 to 3 and 3 to 5, we have this sequence of our gene is this dark blue area right here. That is our gene of interest. That's what says, boom, this is what I need to transcribe. Okay? A little bit prior to that, in front of this gene is an area, kind of what we call upstream. So it's in this direction. It's upstream from the gene. So as I'm, if I'm working with my gene of interest, it's over here. You know, it can be anywhere from, you know, 20 nucleotides to maybe 200, 300 nucleotides before the beginning of my gene. And this area is known as the promoter region, the promoter region. And when that gene or that cell is signaled to make a polypeptide, this promoter region becomes activated. We are making RNA, right? We're going to use this template strand here and create an RNA strand. So at this promoter region, there's going to be the binding of an enzyme, an enzyme that's going to attach RNA nucleotides, or the enzyme that's going to make an RNA polymer. So what do you think the enzyme that's going to attach to the promoter region is called? RNA polymerase, okay? An RNA polymerase enzyme, polymerase. RNA, though, because we're adding RNA nucleotides instead of DNA. Now, it doesn't need that primer enzyme or that primase. It doesn't need, because we're putting RNA down to begin with. It's an RNA polymerase. It binds to this promoter region. And when it binds there, it says, hey, 250 nucleotides up ahead, is, our, is the start of our gene. And that's what it signifies. This promoter region is like this recognition box. Okay? When, we, when this RNA polymerase binds there, it sees it um, as an area. Quite often, you can see here, there's a lot of adenines and thymines clustered in this promoter region. It's usually known as the Tata box. That recognizes it as that promoter region. It doesn't always have to be a ta, ta box, but quite often, that's, you know, what it is. That's, well, what happens is there's some kind of signal into the DNA saying, we need this gene started, okay? And so this signal, this chemical influence of some sort somewhere along the way, whether it's a hormone or a steroid or 
you know, just um, an exchange of chemical environment, something like that is saying we need to start producing this gene. We need to make this polypeptide. And with that, it will cause these different, a bunch of little proteins coming to bind up here known as transcriptin factors. But the key is that this RNA polymerase is going to bind there. And this is basically what initiates transcription, what initiates the, the transcription of our RNA, is all of these transcription factors binding and this RNA polymerase coming in and binding to this promoter region. And when it binds to this promoter region, it sits there and it says, okay, well now I know that my gene of interest is 200 nu nucleotides ahead. And so this RNA polymerase is going to start walking down along that DNA. Now DNA is double-stranded. These transcription factors in the RNA polymerase enzyme allow that DNA to be unwound and unzipped. As it starts moving down it, as it starts walking down along it, it unwinds and unzips the DNA. Doesn't keep it like that permanently, but it unwinds and unzips it in the area where that enzyme is, okay? You see this? And so now what we have there is this RNA polymerase enzyme unwinding and unzipping and allowing this to happen. Now we can start transcribing this DNA. Now I told you this dark blue region here was our gene, right? Well, RNA transcription actually begins even still a little further upstream than the start of our gene. This blue right here is our TAC or whatever, that, that beginning of our gene. RNA transcription begins kind of leading up to that. It's kind of known as a leader sequence. And that's what this light green area here is, showing this leader sequence being transcribed, even though it's not part of my gene. And this is important, and we'll see why in just a few minutes. But it's, it's transcribing this here and then starting with our gene. Now, this RNA polymerase is an enzyme, and it's going to literally walk down my entire chain of DNA. And as it walks, as it's moving along, okay, it's going to can start to add all of these RNA nucleotides. Okay, so we initiated the transcription. We had this recognition box, this promoter region. In comes this RNA polymerase, binds to it, starts to walk down our DNA, starts to move down the DNA. As it's moving down, it's unwinding and unzipping our DNA because DNA is a double-stranded helix. So we have to untwist it, make it straight, and then unzip it, break those hydrogen bonds. As we unzip it, now we're going to start making our RNA transcript. And then we're just going to continue and follow it all the way down along this DNA chain. All the way along, attaching nucleotide complementary base pairing only to the one strand, only to the strand of interest, the DNA template that has our gene on it. That's this one down here. Okay? We will continuously add are nucleotides. Now the other thing about RNA, not only is it a ribose sugar, not only does it have uracil, but it is single-stranded. And because it's single-stranded, it's not going to stay in this double-stranded form. It's going to fall right back off. And as it falls right back off, that DNA can come back together. That enzyme is moving along, separating it out, and as it gets past, it's bringing it back together as it continues to walk along. Does that make sense? So we can see this elongation continuing and this RNA transcript just falling off. And the DNA rewinding back together as this RNA polymerase walks along. And it's going to keep going and keep going until it reaches this area here, this you have this little red part here, which is a termination sequence, and then a little bit more blue, which is the termination signal. And whenever it reaches that termination signal, boom, off comes the RNA polymerase. Back together is the DNA molecule. 
And now we have this completed RNA transcript, just like that. Okay. Any questions on that so far? You can see that it was coded in the five prime to three prime direction. Uh, what, initiation, elongation, termination? Not particularly. Know that while initiation is that RNA polymerase binding to the promoter region basically is what starts it all off. And then it will create that RNA transcript and that's basically elongation, you know, as it's walking through, placing nucleotide after nucleotide until it reaches the end signal and falls off and then everything is back to normal. Um, it just kind of almost falls in, into place with the different steps. Now, this complete RNA transcript is not ready to leave the nucleus yet. It is not a mature messenger RNA. It is just an RNA transcript. It has to go through some further modifications. Okay? <clears throat> there are enzymes in our cytosol that like to chew up DNA and chew up RNA molecules. And that, that's very important because that's how we get those nucleotides back in, recycled, to kind of go back for, into our creating our own DNA and things like that. Well, in order to protect our RNA transcript, we have to modify it somewhat. And so after we have this completed transcript made, now we have to put some protection things to it. And there are two main things that happen. Remember I mentioned that leader sequence? Well, these are those few nucleotides that, that we attached before the start of our gene. Okay, our gene is our coding segment. So this leader sequence was transcribed over here. And so what we've got here on this five prime end is a bunch of nucleotides that really are not part of my gene and are not going to become my protein. It's a leader sequence. And so what happens on this five prime end is almost like, um, I always say that our, our messenger RNA receives a hard hat because if we're making a building, we're a general contractor going out to make a building, right? Well, he's got to be wearing his hard hat. And so we get this five prime cap we get this protective cap put on this leader sequence. It's a methylated group, just kind of um, this, um, a bunch of phosphate groups attached here with some methyl groups and CH3s and things like that to protect the beginning of our coding sequence, to protect the beginning of our RNA. Because we don't want enzymes coming in and eating up our our RNA transcript, right, from this end. We need to protect it. So we put on this hard hat. We put on this protective cap. It's known as a five prime cap that will allow it to go out into the cytoplasm and not be destroyed. And this is very important. We can't let this, pro or this messenger RNA be broken down before it has a chance to make protein. Is that messenger or DNA? Messenger. Messenger RNA. So on the five prime end, it receives this five prime cap, is what it's called. Now we have to protect this side of our transcript also. And so on the three prime end, there is a modification that is going to attach adenine nucleotides and a lot of adenine nucleotides. When I say a lot, anywhere from 300 to 400 to 500 A's attached to this side. And so now this is known as a poly, meaning many, a poly A tail. Because once again, there are enzymes out there that are going to go gobble, 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 and just continuously eat away at those adenine nucleotides. 
working and working and working and working, trying to break down, trying to hydrolyze this entire messenger RNA when it's in the cytoplasm and just get those nucleotides back out there ready to make another RNA molecule. Because our, D our enzymes don't decipher between our own RNA and DNA and the food that we just consumed, RNA and DNA. We can't decipher between the two of them. We don't know what came from us and what came from the cow that we just ate in our steak. We can't decipher that. Our enzymes are just going to break it all down. And so in order to make sure that we get this protein made, we've got to protect it. And the longer the protein, the longer it's going to be in the cytoplasm, the longer the poly A tail. The more adenines that will be attached, the more that will be there to protect it. Okay? Does that make sense? It's just a guanine group, just as part of that, that bi prime cap. I'm not going to go get too worried about it. Why is there. It's just, it's, this poly A tail is just there for that protection. Um, and why they used adenine, I don't know. Um, it's just the way that our cells produced or um, the nucleotide that they decided to utilize. But every messenger RNA is going to have this several hundred adenine nucleotides at the end of its termination signal to protect it from being broken down. Okay, why it wasn't uracil or why it wasn't something, I don't know. Okay. Well, our transcript is still not ready. It's still kind of an immature messenger RNA molecule. Okay? There's one more modification that has to happen. Our DNA, and we saw it on our video yesterday and things like that, but there is a tremendous amount of DNA that we have no idea what it does. We pretty much at this point call it junk DNA, um, but there's a lot of DNA that just doesn't have any rhyme or reason to being there. And some of this DNA happens to fall in the middle of our genes. Okay? Pieces of this unnecessary nucleotides in the middle of a gene. So, for example, if this was my gene of interest, maybe right here, if I separated it out, I could put like another 50 nucleotides that have no meaning to my overall protein and to my overall gene, but it's there in the middle of, the, of my DNA anyway. And so if it's in the middle of my DNA, then it's going to be in the middle of my RNA too, isn't it? And I'm going to have to cut it out because it's not part of that coding sequence. It's not part of what I need. It's just basically junk DNA. And so this junk DNA is what we call introns. And you can see, if this is my entire coding sequence, this dark pink here, well, this light pink are my introns. This is parts of my DNA that were coded in my transcript RNA that are unnecessary. And they even show you, like, the nucleotides. This is nucleotides number 1 through 30. And then however many nucleotides there are in this intron doesn't matter because my next nucleotide that I need, number 31, is over here. So what I've got to do is I've got to cut out these pieces of, of transcript that are unnecessary, that are not part of my coding sequence. I need to remove them. Those that are part of my coding sequence are known as exons, these exons here. Okay. So now it's kind of, once again, why is the terminology like it is? Introns? You know, you would think, why would an intron stay inside the coding sequence and exons come out of the coding sequence? But I look at it a different way. The introns are cut out of our coding sequence. They're removed, spliced out, and stay inside the nucleus. And the exons fuse back together and exit the nucleus as the mature messenger RNA. So think of it that way. Okay. Um, so what we've got is this long, mess, this long RNA transcript. It gets a five prime cap to protect it on this side. It gets a long poly A tail on the three prime end to protect it on this side. 
And now we're going to cut out all of this wasted parts of RNA, that these introns, these unnecessary pieces of RNA. We're going to remove those out, fuse together all of our exons, and now we have the mature messenger RNA that can leave the nucleus and go out and translate into protein.